We are back and we are joined now by Tim Chirac, journalist who has been covering uh, Asia Pacific since the 1970s, author of the book Spies for Hire, The Secret World of Intelligence Outsourcing, and you can also find him over at the Chirac Files where you can support his work. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for coming back on the show today. Thank you very much. So uh, Henry Kissinger, dead at 100. Um, you know, we, we went over this a little bit at the start of the show, but he's responsible for three to four million deaths, ballpark, violent coups in Latin America, genocides uh, in Asia, an, an instrumental figure in prolonging the Vietnam War. Um, a, a, a Outside the United States, Kissinger is considered to be one of the worst criminals, um, war criminals in the modern era. But Tim, what were your... Um, immediate thoughts upon seeing this news last night as somebody who has, you know, ex extensively covered both U.S. empire and, and Asia for decades? Well, what I remembered most clearly was being in Japan in 1972 and seeing the headlines in the Japanese newspapers of Kissinger saying, peace is at hand. And after years and years of you know, opposing the Vietnam War and, and, and being kind of in the middle of it, actually visiting Vietnam when I was a kid, uh, you know, this was like a tremendous thing to hear. You know, we, we this war might be over. And then, you know, every, everyone thought that, you know, believed him, peace is at hand. And then like a few weeks later over the Christmas holidays in 1972, uh, to show the Vietnamese that he meant business and to, uh, you know, to try to drive them back to the negotiating table. Uh, he, the, the, Nixon ordered the bombing of Hanoi by B-52s, days and days of relentless bombing. And this just showed the, the utter hypocrisy and evil nature of this man uh, who was advising Nixon all during this period. And it was just sickening to see, uh, you know, how he pretended to be bringing peace and then inflicting this violence on, on Vietnam and in all of Indochina. And uh, I, I just, you know, Vietnam, you know, had a huge impact on me. I mean, I, would, I you know, like I grew up in Tokyo and Seoul during the Vietnam War. I visited there when I was a kid, uh, 12 years old. My father was a church relief uh, worker and, and, and had did relief all over in, in Japan and Korea after the wars. And, and he had actually gone to Vietnam, you know, to, to look at the situation in the early 1960s. And so, you know, I knew a lot about Vietnam and the truth of U.S. intervention there. And uh, Kissinger's lies just just brought it home how disgraceful, the, you know, this war was. And that, those were my those are my first thoughts, not to mention all the other evil he's inflicted on the world. Well, let's stay on the Vietnam War then for just a little bit, because we, we mentioned this at the start of the show, how uh, basically Nixon and Kissinger were immensely um, deceitful in their uh, what, what they would say publicly about the Vietnam War and what their designs were behind the scenes after Nixon got elected. And they expanded the war quite quickly after taking office. Um, you know, how... And then during that time, uh, I guess, when did K Kissinger become Secretary of State? But he's the only... 69. Um, 69. Oh, Secretary of State was later. He later, was right. National but he Security was Advisor for... National yeah. Security Advisor at that time. And then he's the only person to have ever held that position simultaneously. Um, so just to give people a sense of how powerful he was, he was Secretary of State and National Security Advisor for quite a while. Um, you know, what... Uh, what was that like at that time when, you know, LBJ was opening up some measure of diplomacy at the sunset of his presidency and then uh, they uh, Nixon and Kissinger come into office and expand and then also launch the secret uh, carpet bombing of Cambodia? Well, 1968, uh, people might remember, like, you know, Johnson was relentlessly bombing Vietnam and the anti-war movement was really building up at home and people were really disgusted with, with the war and the violence being inflicted on Vietnam. And, uh, you know, I remember marching in 1968 in Tokyo, Americans against the war, and we were against, you know, we, opposing the bombing of, of, of North Vietnam at the time and also all the bombing and strafing that was going on in South Vietnam. And then during the election of 68, you know, Nixon was promising a secret plan to end the war. 
And as you know, as, as we all learn later, you know, Kissinger was telling anti-war folks that you know Nixon was really serious, and and he himself, Kissinger, was really serious and and agreed with the critics of the Vietnam War. And then it turned out that uh, you know when these negotiations were going on, uh, you know, with the Johnson administration in 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 Paris uh, to, to end the war, uh, you know. Kissinger was there feeding information from the South Vietnamese side to Nixon, and they made, they basically persuaded the South Vietnamese government and the, its military government not to go along with any agreement until Nixon came in. And this is like this really cynical action, and that's a kind of treasonous, you know, to be sending like, you know, top secret information, you know, back to a presidential candidate to undercut uh, the, these negotiations. And then you know they 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 then they then they Nixon announces you know Vietnamization or you know, let the Vietnamese do the fighting and the U.S. is going to slowly withdraw, but they just use this immense power of bombing and massive, you know, massive fire bombing and and, and you know of course they you know and, and bombed Cambodia secretly for years, invaded Cambodia supposedly to drive the you know, clear out the Vietnamese sanctuary, so-called. But it was <laughs> such utter hypocrisy. And, uh, and you know, all this time, of course, he's, you know, working with Nixon to, to reopen uh, relations with China, you know, which was, you know, which was a good thing overall. But basically, they opened relations with China and they wanted what Kissinger later called a decent interval. Uh, you know, to basically let the South Vietnamese government collapse, uh, which everyone knew it would. And that, you know, that finally happened in 1975. But, you know, it, 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 it was all done through lies and deceit. And, and uh, you know, I was glad to see Lee Duc Tho, who was the Vietnamese negotiator when they did reach these, you know, 1973 peace agreements, uh, you know, Kissinger and Lee Duc Tho were given the Nobel Peace Prize, and Lee Duc Tho refused to accept the award because he knew what a complete, you know, hypocrite and, 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 and deceitful person and violent person, you know, Kissinger was. And to his credit, he refused the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, this was a peace after just mass murder in, in Indochina. And, you know, so... It, you know, I, you know, I kept up, you know, I mean, that's how I got into journalism was during the Vietnam War and kind of looking at the economic uh, factors that you know, the business business role that business played in making the weapons and, and the military industrial complex and, and, and how it wanted a more war. And that's how I started in, started into journalism. But I kept pretty careful track of what was going on in the, you know, in the seventies. And, uh, you know, I think that one of the worst things he did, uh, was to give a green light when he was working for president Ford in 1975 was greeting, you know, going to Indonesia, meeting with a general Suharto who had taken over in a very, very bloody coup in 1965 where over a, 500,000 people, communists and Chinese, were slaughtered in Indonesia uh, and gave them a green light to invade the newly independent nation of East Timor, which was alongside one of the islands in that archipelago there. And East Timor had just been decolonized. Portugal had let, there had been a kind of revolution in Portugal, and they had let go of their colonies and so East Timor became an independent nation uh, and uh, there was oil near there and you know Suhart the, the, the government that was taking over in East Timor was a progressive government that wanted to you know do better its people better the conditions of its own people and they gave a green light for Suharto to in, invade this little tiny defenseless island that had hardly any kind of military at all and for years, they did, and they, it was a genocide. You know, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered in East Timor, and it was a virtually unknown kind of struggle, but it just represented the kind of, you know, he just didn't give a rat's ass about people, any other countries, you know, it's just the power of the United States and just use war and bombing 
to get your way. And they and they, and and you know, of course, we all know what happened in 1973 uh, in Chile, where he was behind you know the overthrow of Allende and and uh, undercutting uh, that democratically elected government. Just a disgraceful record. And you know what's really. I mean, it's just sickening to see all these political figures laud him for his statesmanlike actions and uh, what he contributed to American foreign policy. You know, yeah, he, cont he contributed. I, he contributed blood. Tim, Tim I'm, are you, I'm curious uh, to hear you reflect, like the pride of place that he's maintained in American politics. Like, has it surprised you, or is it just kind of symptomatic? Well, it's symptomatic of the way the system works. I mean, we, we reward people who, who uh, you know, do things like this. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, from, you know, I saw Chris Christie, you know, praising him the other day, Democrats, Republicans that, that are in power and out of power, want to get into power. They love this guy because what he represented was the ultimate use of American power. To, to crush any kind of opposition to, to U.S. power anywhere in the world and, and to use the most cynical means, the most violent means, but that's considered, you know, statesmanlike. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just appalling, you know, to hear, hear these liberals especially, you know, uh, praise this guy. Uh, Samantha, what's her name? Who's head of USAID? Power. Power. <laughs> Samantha Power. You know these pictures she has of him. You know, hanging out with Kissinger. I mean, you know, here's someone who spoke out against genocide, right? Tried to make this an American policy issue to stop genocide, and here she is hanging out with a, one of them. You know, a, a man who, who, who key architects of genocide. Out, architect of genocide. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, to, to, Tim, could you expand a little bit on what you were saying about American power and his relationship to it? Because, you know, uh, Spencer Ackerman wrote in uh, his obituary in Rolling Stone today, and he wrote, Kissinger represented an anti-communism without ideological zeal. Kissinger thought viewing the Cold War in ideological terms missed the point. The point was American geopolitical dominance, something measured in impunity and achieved by any means necessary. And I just think that that's an important, uh, an interesting way to frame it, because, you know, there were, of course, many uh, ideological anti-communists, um, but his uh, his ideology was much more tethered to um, American might and exceptionalism by blood and uh, that being uh the the driving force it seems behind what his desires were it just met uh it fit quite nicely with what the uh the zealots in in that uh sense really wanted is that your assessment of really where his ideology uh lied his ideology was all about power that's what right. it was. I mean, it, it, he had no ideals or any, any kind of belief system. It was just about the ultimate use of power. And one of the things that's, that's uh, interesting about, you know, about what Spencer wrote, which, by the way, was a, you know, a terrific piece in contrast to the rest of the crap we've been reading in, in the New York Times elsewhere. Uh, you know, like, you know, Kissinger would stab American allies in the back, too, you know. I mean, like, for example, with China. I mean, here they are cozying up with Chairman Mao and, and all this. And, you know, and a lot of us in the anti-war movement were thinking, wow, they're, you know, Mao's going to sell out the Vietnamese and, you know, and to, you know, like not support them anymore, because, you know, making friends. With, it was appalling to some of us to see to see, you know, that that happen at that time, because, you know, the war was still going on when he met with Mao. But like, uh, you know, it was all about American you know, role in the world and its power in the world. And so like, you know, like in Japan, which was, you know, under this long time, you know, the liberal democratic party, very close ally that had supported the U S throughout the Vietnam war. Uh, and, and, but, you know, Japanese, you know, Japan government and the Japanese businesses badly wanted to get into China for years and they couldn't because the U S had this policy, you know, never recognized China. And so, you know, you would think that, 
in a situation like that, when Nixon shifted gears and went to open relations with China, that they, you know, they might, you know, share that with, with Japan before it happened. They did, but five minutes before, five minutes before the announcement, he told his Jap the Japanese prime minister that he was opening relations with Japan, with China. And, the, uh, you know, the, the story is the Sato, who was the Japanese prime minister, wept because he was so upset by this, you know, betrayal, basically. Uh, and, and, of course, after that, you know, Japan opened up. But, you know, the same thing with, with, with South Korea. I mean, he freaked, they, they freaked out at the time. They were doing this Vietnamization program and, you know, let the let the local, let the natives basically fight for themselves if they want to, you know, keep this war going. And so, like, you know, without any notice to South Korea, he, he withdrew an, an entire division of the U.S. Army from, from South Korea. And, of course, you know, for years they'd been saying, you know, our army protects South Korea from North Korea. He just pulls out the entire 7th Division, like, in, in basically, basically a day. And this was really, you know, detrimental. I mean, this really upset the South Korean government. And, and even though it was under a dictatorship, you know, they began to move toward building an own, their own independent military and nuclear capability, which, of course, the U.S. blocked. Uh, but the thing is, like, he would, he would you know, uh, he, the, the point is he would stab his, his own allies in the back, uh, yeah. you know, to, 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 to get what he wanted in terms of, you know, establishing America's power in the world. Yeah, and I'm forgetting exactly which one of the, you know, uh, great obituaries that I read, uh, including Spencer's in Rolling Stone um, and, and, and uh, Greg Grandin's in The Nation um, and The Intercept uh, by Nick Terse. They also uh, those are the three I would say that that people should should check out um, uh, the the there was this kind of concept of goals being ever changing and essentially shifting whenever it met the needs of the american empire um it, it, is that in uh keepments or there's a dog in the hallway if people can hear that um is that in a a, a good summary i guess of the fluidity of what he represented in terms of like it doesn't matter if these people are our allies in this current moment. If they don't fit our objectives in this particular sense, we'll throw them under the bus because it's time to overthrow this government or install this di dictator, etc. That's exactly how, how he worked. You know, he, he, he couldn't give a rat's ass about supposed friends of the United States. Anything, you know, to, to expand anything to expand American power. And I think like Nick Terse's work is just really excellent because he really, uh, I mean, he wrote, he wrote a whole book, you know, about, you know, the, 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 the way that the war was, Vietnam war was conducted, which was basically shoot anything that moves. That's the name of his book. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of, you know, policy they, they brought to Vietnam. I mean, that had been happening, you know, before, but what was so cynical was, you know, to make it look like, oh, I'm, you know, Nixon coming in with Kissinger and saying, you know, we're going to try to bring peace to Vietnam and we have this plan and it's going to end the war and it's, everything's going to be better. And, you know, we're doing this for freedom and democracy. And, you know, but they 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 they, they just poured on the firepower, you know, to, to get their, you know, to get their position, you know, to, to solidify the position. Like I was talking about that that Christmas bombing. I mean, the part of the Christmas bombing in 1972 of Hanoi that was so horrendous was that, I mean, by the, you know they, they'd already basically agreed to everything on the that, that happened with the Vietnam Peace Accords that were signed in early Jan, uh, 1973. But he wanted the Nixon wanted to show the American people that he was you know tough to the end, and you know they, they, so so you know launched this you know, two weeks of, of carpet bombing of, of Hanoi to show the Americans that, you know, he, he, he really, you know, he, he was going to go out with fire. He wasn't going to just, you know, give up. Uh, and, and so it's, it's like always trying to manipulate the public into thinking that, you know, they were doing something for the, for the good of, the, you know, all the, everybody for the public good. Uh, and then, you know, behind the scenes uh, murder murderous programs, genocide, supporting genocide. I mean, Indonesia, I mean, you know, why do that? Well, you know, there was big corporate interests in Indonesia that supported the yes. Subarto government. 
And I think it's important, you know, not to forget the fact that after, you know, Kissinger left the government, he, he created one of the uh, quintessential, you know, firms. I wrote the, you know, the book Spies for Hire about this sort of, you know, foreign policy, national security for profit, right? He was one of the first people to really do that. Kissinger Associates set the standard for this, you know, revolving door, the spinning door of, you know, officials profiteering off of their government service and offering inside information to corporations and whoever they consulted with, uh, you know, to, to, to help them in their, you know, strategic designs on the world of corporations wanting to take over certain markets, uh, you know, by, by using his, his tapping all of his, uh, government expertise and national security contacts, and also you know highly you know uh, you know secret intelligence uh, to 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 profit. And, and that and was much of what also was driving the uh, overthrowing of Allende in um, in Chile as well, was because the, it was a democratic socialist government that was threatening to re redistribute wealth and also uh, wanted reparations from the United States in that way. And so you can just exactly. see... Yeah, you can just see how uh, it was American might and then like also capitalism uh, and, and uh, the United States' is, uh, hegemony on the world stage that really drove him in this existential uh, way. And it, 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 it's amazing, too, because, you know, Kissinger, despite not being born in the United States, is really as American as any um, any member of the government in that way. And the embodiment of that uh, uh, of U.S. empire in the 20th century, you can just look to Kissinger as that figurehead. Um, Tim, I I know we're going to have to let you go in a second, so I just wanted to ask one question uh, before before we do. Um, how can people look at the uh, United States' support for Israel's bombardment of Gaza right now within the context of uh, Kissinger and his belief system as a continuation of it, as something that we've built off of? Um, wh what's your assessment of uh, how his legacy still resonates within that current context today? Well, that's a good question because I mean it, it, it's a it's it's a con continuity with what Kissinger and Nixon did, but it's also a continuity of what President Truman did. You know, it's like uh, punishing an entire population for a war that their leaders made that may have they have may they may have not have had anything to do with. You know, the 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 terrible terrible firebombing of Japan. And the, and the end of World War II was just directed at civilians, but killing as many civilians as possible to crush the people's spirit. It, you know, they, they gave up bombing factories and stuff. They just carpet bombed, you know, dozens of Japanese cities, in addition to, of course, dropping nuclear bombs on atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that continued during the Korean War. North Korea was for two and a half years. North Korea was bombed by the U.S. Air Force where there was nothing left. That's how the U.S. has won these wars, you know, by massive firepower and by punishing the people, the populations of these countries. It's, you know, collective punishment is the word. And that's exactly what Israel is doing with the people of Gaza. And so it's not just Kissinger. It's a system. It's our system of, of violence against any people that come up against, struggle against American hegemony and American power. That's, that's the system. And I think that that's important for people to remember because Kissinger represented that system. He may be the most evil symbol of this system, but it's part of the system that we have to struggle against. And I think for those of us who came of age during the Vietnam War, that's what we've always been struggling for. You know, like, like, like let's make people life better uh, for people by ending these kind of wars, ending this kind of violence, and doing it through diplomacy and negotiation rather than brute force. Absolutely. Uh, Tim Chirac, uh, you can uh, read his book, the, uh, Spies for Hire, The Secret Work of Intelligence Outsourcing, and then also uh, over at the Chirac Files, you can support him on Patreon and get that's some of his Tim, work that's there. That's timshorak.com, so it's Tim easy Shorak. to find. 
Yeah. Sorry, I was put, placing the em emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, my, <laughs> it's all right. My, I, I my apologies. It. Thanks so much, Tim, for your time today. Really appreciate it.